everyone and welcome to the Zimmer Children's Museum. I'm Deepa Fernandez and I'm here from KPCC. We are live streaming at kpcc.org. So welcome to everybody who's joining us via the live stream and thank you for coming out today. So we're here today to start off our Sunday morning with some play. It's a fun morning. Um, we don't um, we take on a lot of serious topics at the Crawford Family <laughs> Forum. Um, and I am thrilled that we also get to take on things like play. And our panel here today, um, I'm quite envi envious of because these are all people who professionally get to play, involve play in their day somehow. Um, and they are going to be enlightening us, talking to us, helping us to understand ways in which uh, we can help our little ones incorporate more play into their daily diet, which increasingly is being pushed out in into spaces where academics is coming in. Um, so this panel here is is to remind us of the importance of play and to, to help us understand how to make that possible. So we have Dr. Faith Polk, who is an assistant professor at Bradman University. She's a former early education consultant for the Los Angeles County Office of Education. Welcome, Faith. Thank you. We have uh, Calvert Green, who works for an organization that I think you're all going to want <laughs> to come to your school. It's called Playworks Southern California, and he is a fifth-year program coordinator. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Um, we are housed today at the Zimmer Children's Museum. I'm sure you're familiar with that. Um, if it's your first time here, you're in for a real treat. And uh, Julie Brooks is the director of the Zimmer Children's Museum. Julie, thanks for having us and welcome. Thank you, welcome to the Zimmer. And right at the end of the panel there is Ellen Veslock. And Ellen is the preschool director uh, of a preschool called the Child Education Center. And it is a preschool that, as you will learn, puts play, m especially outdoors, but puts play at the center of children's learning. Welcome, Ellen. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. And Ellen, I'll get you to just start very quickly because there's a whole array of really interesting looking things that might not necessarily strike you as the things that kids will play with, but these are playthings. These are playthings, and these came from our program. They're all nature-based items, and I would just welcome you and your children to come up and explore them um, and see what's there and take a look. And if people, uh, parents are just coming in, we are um, reversing things up today. Parents get the lines on the floor, so please come on down and sit down. Um, if you can't do the floor, there are some chairs stacked at the side there, so, so do go ahead and take one. Children are welcome to, um, there's, there's things set up around the room, so you, this is not the space where you have to tell your child to sit quietly. They are invited to play. Um, and, and as Ellen was just explaining, there are, um, which she will tell us more about, but there are some really fun and interesting outdoor nature type items and also um, fabrics that your children are welcome to go over and explore. Um, so Julie, we are at the Zimmer Museum. Can you just give for people who might not know, what does the Zimmer do? Sure. We are a children's museum, which museum can have a bit of a different connotation as far as fine art museums, kind of have permanent collections. Children's museums are designed with immersive play environments or exhibits that allow for hands-on and interactive learning. So the Zimmer Children's Museum, we're a little more based in arts and culture. Some children's museums kind of find their place in science, but we are a little more based in arts and culture. So we provide... Um, kind of immersive play uh, environments. So whether it's playing in the cafe or playing on a real ambulance um, or playing on a real rescue boat, um, we allow children to kind of take on roles and play in those spaces. And hopefully after this, you can all filter on into the museum and, in, and enjoy it um, with your children for yourselves. Calvert, tell us what does Playworks do? Um, Playworks Southern California, um, our job is to facilitate learning through the use of organized play. And what that means is that recess um, used to be, before Playworks, used to be a really disorganized and chaotic time of day where the students would come to the playground and 
if they were playing games at all, there was a lot of disagreement on the rules. There was lots of pushing and shoving. There was lots of standing around. And they were going back to class not able to focus because Johnny did this to me at recess, and we were trying to play, and nothing happened, and blah, blah, blah. And the teachers are spending so much time solving all of these problems that happened at recess, and they can't even get to the academic content. So my job as a program coordinator, or coach as my students know me, is to go in and facilitate that organized play, to teach them the same rules to all of the games so that we're all on the same page, and to teach them that rock, paper, scissors is the quickest and easiest way that you can solve your problems so that you can get back into that game and, p and start playing. And we really find that the kids really get a good grasp on the fact that Playing is better than fighting and arguing, and so we really find a big culture shift at the school where kids were standing around. They're now excited to come out to recess because they know that their favorite game that they just learned in class game time is going to be out there today, and they get to play it with their friends. Let me just uh, quickly um, um, welcome the, the people who are coming into the room, and just to reiterate, parent space is the lines on the floor where we're, we're turning things around today. Children are invited to sit wherever they want, they're invited to play. Um, and, and just just a, a, a check that everybody can hear us and hear us on the panel. If you can't hear someone, just raise your hand or say louder because we're not amplified today. We, are, we do have mics because it's going out on a live stream at kpcc.org, but if you can't hear, let us know. Um, and as a mother myself of a, a three-year-old and a five-year-old, um, this is your space to let to not worry about what they're doing. You can feel free to focus on the panel and let them go. And Ellen, I might just quickly, I, I just saw some regulation going on there between kids. Just very quickly, this is um, a really interesting space set up over here. Uh, maybe you could just one more time invite people because I think parents have just come in. Sure, please, please come up and join us. We are, we are a play-based program at the Child Educational Center and it is about children playing. These are materials from our center. Um, we just brought what we had on hand. These are available to children all day long, every day. And um, it's just, if you take some time as we're talking to really watch what children are doing, I think you'll find it really interesting about how they do manage their play and, and the kinds of things that they can do with just materials that they find in their yard. So I, we, we thought it'd be really interesting to start with faith today because Part of, I think, a big pressure on parents today is that we want to make sure children, and, and on teachers too, children are ready for kindergarten. And being ready for kindergarten today means something very different than it did a generation ago. Um, and, and so, Faith, you started by telling me a story about your own son, which I think was um, reassuring on some level. So maybe you could share that. My son is going to be 13 at the end of the month, and he went to a play-based preschool and never learned formally to write his name or numbers or did anything that was formally academic. There was not the time where we were sat down and we wrote, M-A-X is Max. The kids signed in every day at whatever level they were at. They were had access to all sorts of different play experiences, as you see that Ellen's brought. He's now in seventh grade. He took algebra in sixth grade, which if you know the K-12 system is quite early to be taking algebra. And he has excelled in all the curriculum, but he wasn't pushed and he didn't need that. He was ready when he went to kindergarten. Um, he had self-regulation skills from his play and he had lots of other academic skills from being involved with materials in a variety of ways. So I think, Faith, one of the, the things, you know, that sounds great um, in theory. And to hear somebody else tell you their story of it, I think on some level, though, there, there is this gnawing anxiety that parents carry that their child does need to be able to read and write and do all these things. And quite often, we don't understand exactly what play is doing to help those things get set up. So, so I wonder if you could just give me your overview of, of what does play do? What does play bring for, for young? And we're talking preschoolers, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, four-year-olds. I think um, it's important to understand that there's really no good definition of play. Play shares certain characteristics like intrinsic motivation. Kids want to do it. Adults want to do it. That's being playful. Flexibility. 
people use materials in different ways. I think we were watching the children over there. They had some sticks and they had put some different things. Um, as they engage in these experiences, there are lots of kinds of play. There's constructive play, they build things. They learn to problem solve by building things. It falls down, they gotta try again in a different way. It, there's also pretend and sociodramatic play. When kids are talking together, they take on roles. You've seen it every day. I think uh, earlier Julie was talking about they play in the cafe. I might become a waitress or I might become a patron. I can learn lots of skills, especially self-regulation because I have to attend to the rules of that game. Focused attention, which kindergarten teachers say that that is their biggest challenge is that they don't care if the kids can write their names when they come in. If the children can attend and focus, then they'll be able to learn those skills. So maybe just on that, how does play teach a child to focus? Because it just seems like they're randomly doing things. It seems like that, but they are intrinsically motivated to be there. They have to regulate themselves from becoming, if I decide I'm the waitress, I have to be the waitress the whole time. I can't all of a sudden change and take another role. So I'm focusing my attention on what a waitress does. And that may involve taking orders, right? I might not be writing letters like you would, but I'm gonna do my darndest to write in whatever way I can. So I'm also learning that my talk can make writing. And that is one of the key elements in learning to read, is understanding that it's that oral language can be written down, and then I can read it. One of the th really interesting things that um, we were talking about, you said children, um, there's so much fear for children in, in learning so many of the things that they have to learn, and that doesn't happen in play. Can you talk about that? Um, there's a researcher, Nate Chig sent me hi from Claremont, and he talks about play as a space where you can practice without the fear of the consequences. So think about your own day when you're learning something new, don't you want a space where you can practice and not fear that you're going to make a mistake? That's what play offers our children. Often we notice, too, um, if we watch children during play, they exhibit higher academic skills than they would if we put them into testing situation because we've removed that fear of what the consequence might be if they don't do it right. And so as, um, as children are playing, and, and you've talked about different types of play, some of the things that they're learning, uh, you, you know, you mentioned flexibility. Um, and, and, and I think in terms of, you know, we, we all know that a child's brain is growing exponentially at this point. What, what is play doing in terms of the brain and things like mental flexibility? In play, kids use things for different purposes. So a box might become a house. Or I'm watching a child over here with shells and she's tracing around them she may construct something with them next, right? You don't know what a child's gonna do. They're gonna use something in a different way. They'll use something as a symbol for something else. And that promotes cognitive flexibility and it also promotes understanding that something can represent something else, like a letter represents a sound. So there are all sorts of academic outcomes that we see that are related to what children do in their Play. And for those of you who are sitting at the back, there's a great example of problem solving going on right here as a little one's <laughs> trying to um, shepherd some some shells onto a book. And I've just watched her. Can you talk through that? Like, I, what's going on there? Cause you, how do you teach problem solving otherwise? To uh... That's how children learn. Uh, you know when the baby keeps dropping the cup and off the high chair? Anybody ever see that? <laughs> yes. And, and as an adult, you're like, oh, how many times do I have to pick this up? That's the way the child's learning cause and effect. Okay? And problem solving. You may solve the problem by picking up that cup. Or if the child's mobile and not in the high chair, the child might resolve that problem. So this child kept trying to get the shells over there and she found different ways. Maybe I'm going to pick up one. Maybe I'm going to pick up two. Maybe if she had a bucket, she would have chosen, to, oh, I can now put these in there. And that's part of play. Should adults intervene in play? You know, there are times when adults will play with the children and become involved in the play. And um, that's a very culturally based thing. But one thing we know about uh, adults becoming involved in the play is we can actually heighten the play and increase language development by using more language with children during play. Um, 
I would say if you're going to become part of the children's play, it's always best to follow the children's lead. I mean, I think there's that, um, just finally that thing that many parents will relate to of, you know, picked up kids when you're coming home, you're getting dinner ready, you're doing all these things, and there's this guilt that you're not playing with your kids, you're not interacting with them, and then you kind of tell yourself, well, okay, but maybe they, everyone says they need to play by themselves. I, I mean, is there a balance? Should you be playing with them some of the time or letting them play more by themselves? What, what? I think there's always a balance. You're going to find that there are times where children need to play independently. It's very good for them because they develop that self-regulation and ability to play on their own. Um, but to really increase what they're going to get out of the play, it's best if a more competent other, and it may be a sibling or an adult, play with them because you know more about the real world and can teach them by playing with them. It's also very good for you because adults need to play too. Thank you. And we will be able to be talking more with Faith. We're going to talk a little bit to each of the panelists um, and then we'll be taking your questions as well. If you're listening to us on the live stream, this is kpcc.org. We are at the Crawford Family Forum event talking about play. Today we're not in Pasadena. We are here at the Zimmer Children's Museum. We've got... Um, a, a bunch of lovely kids playing around. You can probably hear them in the background taking advantage of all the great materials. And we are joined on our panel by Julie Brooks, who is the director of the Zimmer Children's Museum. Now, you started to talk to us about immersive play. Um, and I'm just going to ask you, for, for those of us who might not know, what is immersive play? Sure. So, for example, in a children's museum setting, we have play stations or play environments. So, um, and we, we completely encourage all of the things that Faith has already mentioned and being able to, to, use, to use regular household items and materials. But we also understand that in a setting where kind of the environment is given to you, that also gives kind of structure is freedom. It gives you a place to start. It gives, you a, it gives children a vocabulary. It gives children a setting. It gives them kind of an informed place to then play. So Faith had kind of mentioned the cafe space. So when you walk into one of our exhibits, that's the Blue Bagel Cafe, and it's already kind of outfitted with diner seats with a cash register, with, um, with items that, so it then allows them to take on roles naturally because it's generally their spaces in the museum that reflect things that they've seen or things that are already in their reality. So they might have flown in a plane, but at the Zimmer Children's Museum, they can fly a plane. So they can sit in the pilot seat. They can be flight attendants. They can be passengers. They can determine where they're going. So those kinds of decisions that they can't do when they're actually flying in a plane, they can do in that kind of immersive environment because it's built for them to then kind of suggest some of those stories to play out. And, and what do kids, I mean, you know, just what do they get out of that? Because in some ways it feels like, then aren't they just copying us adults? Well, I, I like to, I kind of like to think of it as the opposite. So, um, so yes, they are modeling some behaviors that they might see, but I also like to think of it as they're actually, they're setting up their own kind of social strata. They're making their own rules. And this is something that's already kind of been touched on a little bit, but, but it, by the nature of child-directed play, they're in charge of those environments. So often in the Zimmer, you will see a child be the pilot and the parent be the passenger. Or you will see the child be the doctor and the parent be the patient. So they're able to kind of take on those roles of power that they typically don't get to be in real life. Um, and it's a practice. It's a practice in social negotiation. It's a practice in what those, you know, and you also, you also hear too, you know, did Steve Jobs become Steve Jobs because he was allowed to be in his garage kind of tinkering as a young child and building and learning those concepts? So it's letting them try on a lot of different roles to not only understand what those roles do, but also then decide where their kind of gifts and talents and interests lie too when they can kind of practice those things. I mean, so I hear, I hear an important... Um, directive maybe to parents and to teachers and to, to adults really in that in that you know children do need a space where they can be in control not just of their peers but maybe also of mommy and daddy sometimes or of adults Is absolutely that I mean many of our many of our kind of socially constructed rules feel very arbitrary to children, right? So this is a space where they are. It is theirs. They can control it. They set the rules. They, I mean, we, we obviously at the Zimmer encourage 
playing well together, being kind to each other, helping to, but, but children will navigate those things together. Um, so we do encourage them having a space that belongs to them, that they own, that they can direct, and that they can learn to make those decisions um, and kind of navigate those. We really think that it's, um, it's important, especially from a social and emotional place, where they can learn what those roles are, they can practice them, and hopefully they can envision how they want to interact as adults and kind of practice it here. So we hope that it creates more compassion, more empathy, more, um, and the ability to more gracefully navigate social situations by, by trying them on as kids. And how, I mean, it's, 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 you know, you see some of the things that the Zimmer has set up and it's wonderful. I mean, kids love it clearly. How can parents make that at home or maybe a preschool director set up a little station that encourages it. How do, how do we do that at home? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we like to make sure that we're always providing um, acti ac activities or guidance or our play guides or, or helping folks understand that you, while it's, while it's fascinating and wonderful to be in those immersive environments, you can do a lot of things at home that replicate that same kind of play or guide that play. So, for example... Right, so so we're going to play a little what in the world of dramatic play we call object transformation game. It's a very fancy name for something that's very simple. <laughs> so I'm holding a spatula, which most of us have in our kitchens. So, but I bet in a, probably a series of ten seconds we could come up with ten things that this could be. So, a micro microphone, a hammer, uh, anybody? A fly swatter, a tennis brush. racket, a paintbrush, right? So, so any of those can set the stage for then. If it's a paintbrush, your child becomes an artist and plays out that scene. If it's a fly swatter, they're chasing flies or any number of right world threatening beasts that they determine <laughs> is, uh, is are attacking their house, right? If it's a um, right, so there's so all of those. It's simple as this can be transformed to set the stage to create a space for dramatic play, even though it's a spatula. So, uh, so I think, you know, we all um, can probably remember back to our childhoods where we didn't get to go to Target and pick out the latest whatever pre-made toy and get, you know, we were probably playing with things like this at home. Um, do you do you feel like you know we've lost something in the the move to a lot of pre-made toys? I I think there's a balance. I think some of those things can suggest very wonderful activities. For example, my own I have a nearly 4-year-old who like loves to play store at home. So he has he uses our recy you know our reusable grocery bags and he goes around and he might be buying dinosaurs or whatever happens to be around the house. Um, but we also, we got him a cash register because it was one of the things that kind of added to that experience. So I think it's still about balance because he's still purchasing all kinds of things. He's still very much playing with in his own rules, but that for him helped to kind of facilitate the reality of that space. So I think it's about creating balance and some, and they're fun. I can't, you know, there's wonderful, wonderful toys on the market, but I think it's, again, I think faith is, I think balance is very, very important. Um, and then playing a role with them helps them to expand that um, exploratory space as well, so. And just um, finally, Julie, is there, is there particular places um, that people after today might wander into the Zimmer that you might point out to them that might be a good example of dramatic, uh, dramatic or imaginative yeah, play? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think I think folks first kind of assume that dramatic play requires, and we're in Hollywood, so requires kind of the craft of the actor, those kinds of things. But we're all innately kind of performers and storytellers. That's how children put their word to world together, and quite honestly, it's how all of us put the world together is through stories and narrative. So we do have a theater, so that's going to be the first place that people are going to assume this is where you do dramatic play. But I actually think less dramatic play is done in the theater, even though we have lots of materials, fabrics, costumes, all of the above, um, that, that can kind of set that as a performance space. But I actually think most of our dramatic play and most of our compelling play happens in places like our cafe 
or in our market where you can take on those roles or on our plane or on our rescue boat. We have a rescue boat that was actually used in Hurricane Katrina um, and is now part of an exhibit here at the Zimmer. And kids play Coast Guard. They play rescue. They play So those kinds of things, they're generating higher levels of dialogue. They're, generating, they're creating more of a robust kind of relationship among characters than they actually are on stage. So while, while playing on stage is still fun, but the real dramatic play is happening in those suggested environments. Great, thank you. Sure. So we also have Ellen Fesslock. And Ellen, we've been watching children take on these things, a little girl in front with one of the pieces of swaths of fabric, um, throwing it in the air and watching it land. Can you talk to us a little bit about why you chose to bring some of these materials today? Well, one of the things that that we like to emphasize in our program is the opportunity for children to have materials that are extraordinarily open-ended. And while there's a, a great place for the kinds of things that Julie just talked about, we also want to have things that can be anything. So the idea that a scarf could be um, a, a dress or a cape or a hat or a parachute or whatever children might create from that. Um, I watched a couple of boys pretending um, they had pods and they were uh, um, my interpretation was that they were fighting a fire because I heard fire, fire. Um, and so I love the idea that we can have materials that can become anything children want them to become. And the other piece of it is that, that children connecting with nature is really, really important. And I think in our day and age, and for a variety of reasons that I don't have nearly enough time to go into, we are having more and more children who are inside, plugged in, really disconnected from nature and nature is in really important to us as humans, um, really important to children and there's a, a lot of research that indicates that children are happier when they're outside and in nature, they learn better when they're outside and connecting with nature, they play better with one another, their social skills and language skills are increased when they're outside and in nature. So um, a lot of our program really is spent with children being outdoors with the kinds of things that you see here, or indoors. These are also materials that we um, have in our indoor environments. Um, but that idea that children have uninterrupted time, time to really immerse themselves in the kinds of things that Julie was just talking about, all the things that she said um, in terms of play could happen also with these materials over here. So while the museum is fabulous in that respect, you don't have to recreate the museum to give your children really incredible experiences. Um, I had a parent who emailed a video to me after a parent meeting where we had talked about play, and it was of her two daughters who were two and five um, playing with a box. They had an appliance box, and the video showed the two girls rolling in the appliance box over and over and over and belly laughing. And the mom said in the video, they did this for 45 minutes nonstop. Um, and so that's the kind of play that we're really looking for for children um, in a variety of levels. So I think one of the things, um, you know, that even that example speaks to really well um, is is somewhat also of the fear that parents have. And, and, and I know that you said even you have to reassure your parents that play is okay because today there is so much pressure to make sure reading and writing and, and you know, we're starting math and we can do all these things. How does, how, how, how does that, how do you reassure a parent who comes to you and says, but Johnny's not writing yet? Um, how much time do we have? <laughs> um, you know, children do learn those skills, and I think Faith really addressed that so eloquently. Um, our children do leave our program, in, go into kindergarten, they go into private schools, they go into their local elementary schools, they are successful as they move on. They learn math skills through creating patterns with shells and rocks. They learn science skills through gardening in the garden. They learn literacy skills with the books that, are, um, that they're reading, that they're um, talking about. Um, uh, there was a child, a little girl, who took some shells over to the table and she was tracing them. One of the things that we emphasize in our program is um, the idea of going from three-dimensional to two-dimensional. So we encourage children to do sketches of their works, whether it's sketching natural objects or sketching their block building um, or sketching some interesting um, fruit that, has for, that we're having for snack. 
Um, that's a really great literacy reading skill, um, that transference from three-dimensional to two-dimensional. Um, you know, Faith talked about her son writing his name as he signed in. We have those kinds of opportunities um, that happen within play. If you have a restaurant, um, we have um, ticket books for children to write their, um, take the orders on or to write up the, the receipt on. So children are having opportunities for reading, math, and science all day long. Um, and, you know, we were talking about the balance of adults interacting or not, and that's the, the sign of a really good teacher is being able to step in when it's needed, be a provocateur to really um, sort of poke the underbelly of the child and, and get them moving a little bit further and to suggest some of those things that are going to give them the skills that they need to be successful. Your preschool has been really deliberate in how it's set up its space, you know, along the lines of the Zimmer Children's Museum, though different. Can you talk about um, how the learning happens in those spaces? Because it's, it's, it's replicable, for sure. Sure. I'm going to just pass some, I've got some photos, and I'm just going to pass those around so you can take a look and, and get a sense for it. Um, it is very, very deliberate in that we have classrooms like any preschool. Well, there are some classless preschools that are completely outside. But, you know, we our indoor environment is fairly typical in that we have the kinds of materials that you would expect to find in a preschool classroom, perhaps with a few more nature items. Um, a lot of programs don't allow, allow children sticks and rocks. Um, but we also have an amazing outdoor environment. We're really fortunate to have a huge outdoor space. And our doors are open all day long. So children don't wait for recess time. They don't wait for their 20 minutes to go out and play. If this is a day that they really feel like they need to get out and move and go pick up some logs and build with sticks, then they can do that for their day. And so our day really is based around children playing within the environment, either inside or out. So, I mean, in, just, to, just to make it clear for everybody here, it's, it's not a case of, you know, at 9 o'clock in the morning we're playing outside and then we come in to do Correct. an activity. If the children want to stay outside, they can stay outside. They can stay outside. Or, um, we open our outdoor space about 8 o'clock in the morning and they are free to move in and out as they choose, kind of like being at home. I mean, we really want children to feel like our outdoor space is their backyard. We don't call it a playground. We call it the outdoor classroom. Basically, everything that's happening indoors can also be found outdoors. So we have books outside. We have blocks outside. We have music. Um, all the kinds of things that you would find in an indoor classroom are also happening in the outdoor environment. So not only um, are there is a wonderful array of things for children to do, but as I said before, the learning that happens is actually deeper and better when they're outside. And, and you have the, um, the, the privilege, really, to have watched this program in action for years. So it's, it, I, I wonder if you can tell us then from that vantage point, do you, f I mean, m you know, I think a fear would be, well, well, my child will just stay in the sandbox all day because that's what they love to do and they'll never learn. They'll, they won't pick up the shell and trace it because maybe it's something they're not really strong in. So they'll just favor what they can or they'll just keep zooming the truck down the little hill over and over and over and over again. How are they actually going to learn? Well, and that's, the, that's why we hire really excellent teachers because if we find that a child is really stuck in one place and isn't moving forward, the teachers are going to be, as I said earlier, provocateurs. They're going to talk to that child about, and, about being in the sandbox and figure out what it is that they're really working on because typically if we see a child in one space doing something over and over and over, they're working through something. So teachers want to figure out what that is and invite them to work through that in other ways. And we've been very successful in helping children move out of the sandbox and rarely do we have someone in that situation that just spends all their time in one space. It's a big beautiful environment and it's so um, in, um, enticing for children to move from space to space so we don't see children really getting stuck. Um, but if we do, we help them move on if that seems appropriate. And sometimes it's appropriate for a child to spend their time um, choosing to do what they're doing because, it, like I said, they're working through um, something. And just finally, tell us a little bit about, I mean, all children love to dress up. And increasingly these days, costumes, you know, even if you're picking them up at a thrift store, are a store made Cinderella or Superman or something that you just put on and play the role. How, do, how does your preschool see dress up? Well, we really like for things to be unscripted. And the closer you get to a commercial character, the more scripted it is. 
So if you have, for instance, um, Cookie Monster, and I love Sesame Street, so this is not um, a bash on Sesame Street at all, but if you have Cookie Monster and you ask a child who it is, the child is going to say Cookie Monster. If you say, what does Cookie Monster say, they're probably going to say, me love cookies. If you give them a sock puppet and you ask them what, what it is or who it is, they're not going to have an answer. It can be anybody they want it to be. And if you ask them what it says, it can say anything they want it to say. So the idea of having dress-up clothes, what we do is we provide fabrics. We have a lot of fabrics over here. Um, children create their own costumes. They create their own story. They create their own script. And that requires a lot more brain power than the script, following the script of a television show or a movie. So we really want children to... Um, have their own script, and, and Julie talked about that as children are, are playing in different scenarios, really just creating their own story um, and finding what works for them. And, and actually, we find boys dress up a whole lot more um, when we just have fabrics, because most dress-up clothes are really geared towards girls. So when we have fabrics that boys can <coughs> wear in a variety of different ways, um, we have them dressing up a whole lot more than we do um, when, we, when we have more scripted kinds of things. Less, less Superman heroes. And That's right. <laughs> Great. So thank you, um, Alan. And, you know, as the, the panelists will all be here for your, for your questions very soon and, you know, feel free to go over and explore with your child some of the things over there. We also have here Calvert Green, who is with Playworks, Southern California. So Calvert, how does, play, what, how does Playworks work with schools? What, what do you do? So my job is to go in there and change the recess culture. Um, that's the, the bulk and the, the heart of what I do. And you work with public schools? I work with public, we all work with public elementary schools. My school is K-5. And my job is to make sure that they are outside and they're playing by the rules that we've all agreed upon um, when I brought them out in individual class game time sessions. Um, I have a leadership development portion, so I'm out there with those students making sure that they can sort of take ownership of their playground and help their friends problem solve even without me standing there all of the time. And so the basic idea is that recess is a really chaotic time of day and kids are going back and forth to the principal's office and kids don't know how to solve their problems correctly. And so our job is to really go in there and fix all of that through the use of organized play. And so what are we talking about? Things like, I mean, when we, I think we we all can imagine what recess on the playground looks like. It kind of feels like that is the free time to just run around and be crazy and get out all your energy and then you come back into class and you sit down at your desk. Exactly. That is the free time for them to run around. But what we're finding is that because the kids can't agree on the rules to the game or because in the past there was not a steady adult out there to help them facilitate the organized play, that they're not taking advantage of all of the things that are on the playground. You step out onto the playground and there's, there's probably a four square court there and there's probably a handball court there and there's probably a racetrack there and there are probably kids hanging out trying to play variations of these games, but they're all gonna fall apart really quickly if you think you hit the ball and that means it's in and I think you hit the ball and I think that's out. Now so what do you do? So we do rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> we do rock, paper, scissors. The quick and easiest way to solve all of your problems. Rock, paper, scissors and the kids understand it. The kids not only understand it um, as a means of um, conflict resolution outside, but I have teachers coming up to me telling me that inside I had two students approach an activity at the same time. And instead of arguing back and forth about who was going to play with it, they did rock, paper, scissors quickly and that solved the problem. So, so uh, you know, you, it's a, a little bit along the lines of what Ellen was talking about, adults intervening in very strategic ways. Yeah. So can you talk about, I mean, why, why a structured game with some adult intervention like Foursquare or Handball versus just free running or free play? There is definitely space on my playground for that. There is um, an, a, an area on my playground that I call the imagination station um, for the younger kids on my playground to be able to go into that space and just pretend to be whoever it is that they want to be. But as the kids grow up, they want to play games with each other. And so the handballs and the four squares and the kickballs, those allow the kids to play games with each other and learn what it means to respect one another 
another and learn what it means to resolve a conflict and learn what it means to speak to a student um, assertively rather than speak aggressively. You know, and, and I'm just gauging by the, the age of the children that we have in the room here and guessing that many of the parents in the room might not yet have hit <laughs> kind of mid-elementary school yet. Maybe you have an older child who's there, but, um, you know, I think ma many, many parents might imagine, isn't that the role of the teacher who's on duty out there to, like, help kids? Does that, does that not happen in... Um, it happens now that PlayWorks is there, but you find that they're they're so bogged down by standards and teaching the content and making sure that their test scores look this way. Like they have more than enough to deal with on their plate. So we find that when we go into the, the elementary schools, they're thanking us because now when the kids come back from recess, they're not going back and forth saying, this is what happened at recess, and it wasn't fair, and it, it was my turn, and oh my god, I didn't get to play the game the right way, because they went out there and they solved their problems the, their own way through rock, paper, scissors, and they're playing the games the way that we learn together in class game time. So it's really taking a lot of pressure off of them so that they can focus on what they're doing in the classroom. So Calvert is going to actually lead us in some examples. We're going to play um, so that we can all get a sense of how this is done. All right, so I'm going to have everyone who would like to join me stand up, and we're going to make a circle right here. I have two other coaches in the back who are going to step up to assist me. We are going to sing the Make a Circle song while we make that circle. If you have some students that are oral, if your child is oral, they are more than welcome to join the circle too because they will be, um, they'll probably like the game too. Make a circle. Make, make a circle. Make a circle. Make, make a circle. Make. A circle, make, make a circle, make, make a circle, make, make a circle. Sure. Yes, adults can play too. All right, we're gonna make our circle nice and tight. We're gonna get in here like shoulder to shoulder, friends. We're gonna get in here like shoulder to shoulder. All right, this is my friend Bob. Everybody say good morning, Bob. Good morning, Bob. And Bob is so cool because Bob has his own song and dance. It goes like this. Bob the bunny. Bob, Bob the bunny. Bob the bunny. Bob, Bob the bunny. Bob the bunny. Bob, Bob the bunny. Very nice, friends. So go ahead and everyone put your hands behind your back. And while we sing Bob the Bunny's song, we're going to pass Bob the Bunny around behind our back. So we're going to try to get him all the way around the circle as quickly as we can while we sing the song and do the dance. There we go. We got another friend. Nice. One, two, ready, go. Bob the Bunny. Bob, Bob the Bunny. 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 Bob the bunny, Bob Bob the bunny, 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 Bob the bunny, Bob Bob the bunny. Bob the bunny, Bob Bob the bunny, Bob the bunny, Bob Bob the bunny, Bob the bunny, Bob Bob the bunny, Bob the bunny. There you go. Bob the bunny, Bob Bob the bunny, Bob the bunny, Bob Bob the bunny, Bob the bunny, Bob Bob the bunny, Bob the bunny. All right, very nice, friends, very nice. So how the game works, we're going to get one friend to stand in the middle, and that friend is going to close their eyes nice and tight. We're going to pass Bob the Bunny around our backs, just like we did while we sing the song four times. How many times are we going to sing the song? Four times. At the end of the fourth time, the friend in the middle is going to open their eyes. Everyone else is going to have their hands behind their back. Even if you don't have Bob, those hands have got to stay behind your back. When the friend in the middle opens their eyes, they're going to try to guess which friend in the circle has Bob behind their back. Thumbs up if we all understand how the game works. Do I have a volunteer friend that would like to be in the middle first? 
You want to go? All right, in the middle, buddy. Now, can I have you step in and hope he closes his eyes? All right, he's going to keep his eyes closed nice and tight, and we're going to go one, two, ready, go. Bob the bunny, Bob, Bob the bunny, Bob the bunny, Bob, Bob the bunny, Bob the bunny, Bob, Bob the bunny, Bob the bunny, Bob, Bob the bunny. Whoever has it, hold on to it nice and tight. Whoever has it, hold on to it nice and tight. Everybody else, get those hands behind your back. Our friend in the middle is going to get three guesses about who has it. Three guesses. Can you show us your hands? Can we say, good job, nice try? Can you show us your hands? Ooh, can we say, good job, nice try? Ooh, can we say, good job, nice try? Go ahead and show us who has Bob the Bunny. Oh, it was right there. All right, thank you, everybody, for joining the circle. Thank you, thank you. You can hold on to it, too. So did you guys like that? Do you do that at home? No Bob the Bunny at my house. No Bob the Bunny? <laughs> that's like the perfect, that's the perfect game for days like this when the kids can't go outside and they're cooped up and they don't know what to do and they're bored with the TV and they're in your face and you want to know, you have no idea what to do with them. All you need is any type of thing and a circle and you can do this game. So, so what, I mean, talk us through a little bit. Like there was, there was kind of chanting and rhyming and some rhythm and s like what's going on in that what appeared to be a pretty simple game? What appeared to be a pretty simple game, like you said, do we have the chanting and the rhyming. We also have the movement for the smaller kids. I focus a lot. I spend a long time focusing on really getting it around the circle without dropping it, singing and doing the dance at the same time, and just really building that sense of community for the kids so that um, they know that these are my friends and that when Mr. Green comes around, that's when my kids know me as when Mr. Green comes around, we're going to get a cir in a circle and we're going to play a really fun game. Bob the Bunny is like, s on a rainy day, you can hear kids singing Bob the Bunny through my hallway because they know it's raining, we're about to play Bob the Bunny and they're excited. I mean, it also seems like, you know, there, there was, there was a, and, and I watched it, there was a, a millisecond of um, uncomfortableness of the silliness of it from, more from the adults. From but the adults. <laughs> but, but what, what about silliness? I mean, it seems like silliness is a part of play. Exactly, especially with um, some of our older kids. The younger kids, they're, they're silly. They have no problem getting there, especially when they understand that this is the time. The younger kids have no problem getting silly. But with our older kids in the school, we have to get them out of their shell. But when they get out of that shell, they understand that this is, this is the time for that. This is the time that I have to express myself and be silly and be fun and have a really good time so that when I'm done in this space, now I can go back inside and I can sit down and I can do the more structured learning from the teacher, et cetera, things that's going on inside of the classroom. So we're going to open it up for, for Q&A, and um, we have Elaine here has a mic, so just raise your hand and she will come to you. I will be repeating the questions for our live stream. But I just, um, as we're waiting for that, Faith, very quickly, silliness. Can you give us the, um, you know, it, it seems like it's important. What, what do we gain from being silly? We all have to have positive affect, right? We need to have social emotional development and part of that is releasing and having that place where like Chick sent me high, there's no, said, there's no fear of repercussions. 
and we all play and we need to play and a lot of businesses now are actually looking at how they're structured and whether they offer that opportunity because without play we're not productive I mean, think about how many hours you sit, if you work in front of a computer, you sit there. There's a certain point where you're, you're done. If you get up and you play and you have a time to do something and relax your brain, you can come back and be more productive. Great. So you should take Bob the Bunny to, uh, to your office cooler, <laughs> water cooler. Office recess. Office recess. Do it. Okay, we have a question down here. My name is Erin Royer Azerlant, and I am the parent of three young children, a five-year-old who will start kindergarten this fall. Can everybody hear back there? <laughs> and I have twin, boy-girl twins who are now three. And I am a big advocate of play-based learning, and all of my children are in a play-based preschool. But my question is, for kindergarten, is, can anyone speak to, it seems like there's a very large difference between preschool and once they start kindergarten, it gets very academic very quickly and about bringing more play-based learning into elementary school in those early years and allowing them to sort of phase into more academic learning. Um, I know, Ellen, you don't bottom out at pre-K. You, you go into elementary we, we, school. We don't have an elementary school, but we do have before and after school care um, for school age children, surround care. So we have families that are in our program from birth through sixth grade. So we follow them, you know, and we're able to see um, what happens and I think you know children actually make that transition really well I think early childhood educators like myself across well across the country certainly and around the world um, would really like to push back you know we talk about academics being pushed down uh, more and more and I think we'd like to raise our hands up and push it back up where it belongs um, children seem to manage okay. We know that they would be better if they had a play-based program for kindergarten as well, um, you know, like I had when I was in kindergarten. Um, but we do see, you know, all the things that Faith talked about earlier of, of all those, those um, self-regulation skills that children learn really come into play then when they're in kindergarten. You know, when Calvert talked about, um, you know, having to regulate games, we see children, four and five-year-olds, being able to monitor their own games and and so they get into situations and can do that because they have the skills to do that um, from early on. Calvert, you wanted to? Yeah, for that exact reason, um, my kindergarten teachers um, specifically um, ask for time in the day where they can practice facilitating the games that they've seen me facilitate with their students because they have that understanding that their children that are coming from pre-k were playing a lot and now that they're in these more academic settings that change is really difficult for them so when they see games that um, I'm doing with their students that their students are really engaged in they want to see if they can do those games on their own without me there because they understand that it helps to build that bridge mm -hmm. okay. I think also um, I also I used to teach kindergarten and I remember my son much later went to kindergarten and I dreaded oh my gosh he's gonna sit in a desk all day how's this gonna work well play is a vehicle for learning and one of the things we know now is that with common core standards coming we're going to see probably a lot more of playful learning in especially the earlier grades because Common Core requires that the play, that the learning be meaningful. Mm -hmm. And in order for learning to be meaningful to young children, they need to be actively engaged and it needs to make sense to them. So I think that there is some hope um, as we are training new teachers too, that we're spending a lot more time on understanding child development and learning and that will help uh, bring that back but Cat, I just a concern. quick follow-up for Calvert um, is just is could could a, a, a public school or a PTA apply to get Playworks to come to their elementary school um, so we do have a couple of requirements um, for schools um, that we do sign on um, for schools that don't meet those requirements, we have the training department. So um, Playworks will send somebody to your school to show you the way that we do things and to teach you our, our philosophy on play. Um, but yes, there is a certain set of requirements that um, and our public schools have to meet. And does it cost money? Do the schools hire it you? Does, it does cost a l uh, money. We actually fundraise half of it as Playworks ourselves as a nonprofit. We fundraise half of what it costs to have um, a program coordinator, and then we ask the school to bring in a little bit less than half of um, the rest of what um, it costs. Okay. 
I would also, and this is not necessarily a shameless plug for the Zimmer Children's Museum, however, utilize community resources yes. too that give you those opportunities. And the Zimmer has a very modest entrance fee, but we also have a very robust We All Play initiative, um, an access initiative to ensure that no child is ever turned away because their family can't afford that price of admission. So agencies, we're a nonprofit. Agencies like that can facilitate. And one of the things we haven't really touched on are parks. So there are still really wonderful parks in this city and allowing your child just time to be outside and time to play. So I would also say just, just kind of check out the, because we're still, the transition to incorporating more play in early elementary will take some time. So utilize those community resources that exist too to give your child that kind of, those kinds of experiences too. And not all of them cost a lot of money, so. There are also a couple of other um, resources that are free. Um, there are some downloadable family club kits from um, Nature. I'll just pass these around so you can get a sense of them. If you truly don't know um, what to do with your children outdoors, if you're not an outdoor person and you really don't know how to help your children get connected with nature, these are really simple activities that you can do with them. And there's a, um, a side that has some instructions for the adult um, and the other side that has the, the um, activity. Um, and they are free. Um, you can just download them off the, the Nature Explorer website. Um, and that information is, is on that packet. So um, feel free to take a look. Um, because I think sometimes parents go to the park but don't know what to do um, or just send them off to the to the playground onto the climbing equipment and there's so much more that's out there that's available um, for children to do in, in getting connected with nature um, and that can be a start. Do we have another question? Hi, my name is Will. I have a son who's uh, almost four and a daughter who's uh, two. Now, uh, I grew up in a family where... Will, it's really where hard to I hear grew, you. I grew up in a family where boys rough house, girls you play gentle with. Well, now that I have two kids of my own, I rough house with my, with my son. And my daughter likes to rough house, but is it okay or do I need to learn how to play dolls? <laughs> <laughs> Great question. I, I say go for it. Um, I think we do gender stereotype what our children need, and they will tell you what they need. And girls love rough, rough housing. Um, they also love dressing up, but they, they, they love rough housing. And I know when I was a, a teacher, and, and our teachers continue to do this, we have uh, times where, you know, I loved the game Teacher on the Bottom, um, where children would just pile up on me, and girls love that just as much <laughs> as boys do. Um, and there's some, there's a lot of self-regulation that actually comes into that because you have to play in a way that's not hurtful. Um, you have to, you have to control your body. You have to read the other person's cues. Is that other person still having fun? Um, you have to really do a lot of that social learning about is this a game that we're all still enjoying? So I say go for it. I think that leads just very quickly to, to another interesting point, which is something that, you know, at your preschool, you're very conscious about. And I think the gender stereotypes in kids and play are so much more pronounced today. Um, and, and I wonder if you could maybe just even talk through how you, you mentioned in the dress up, boys are getting dressed up. But how do, how do you deal with that? We try to avoid pink. <laughs> no, um, seriously, though, we, we want we really want to provide equal opportunity for all materials. We don't want to set up an area that's really gender specific for girls. I mean, I really hate walking into Target and seeing the, the pink aisle or any any store, not just Target, but any toy store where there's a pink aisle that suggests those are the only toys that girls are going to be interested in, when in fact, girls love rocks and shells and trucks and all kinds of things that we don't necessarily think of them using. So we want to set up an environment that isn't gender, st gender stereotyping. And if girls want to play in the house area and dress up and be mom, that's great. Um, but we're not saying that that's where you have to play. If girls want to be out playing baseball and boys want to be in playing dolls, that's OK, too. And, and just one more follow-up on that question. Um, I, I was doing some reporting on this, on the issue of play, and one of the experts who I interviewed was actually talking about the need for roughhousing type of play, how that is actually, you know, and counterintuitively, I think, you know, you, you see the roughhousing play going on and your instinct is to stop it or to regulate it or to pull them apart. 
Um, but actually, that is important. I wonder if any of you can speak to what you gain from, what children gain from that kind of um, rough play. I'm happy to answer again. Um, <laughs> you know, ch uh, as I said earlier, children learn self-regulation. They learn um, how to monitor other interactions. But, at, you know, at the core of it all, we're mammals. Mm -hmm. And if you look at any other mammal young, what are they doing? They're romping. They're playing. They're pouncing on each other. And that's really about how they learn about themselves. They learn, they learn what they can do. They learn about what they're capable of. They learn about others and how they interact and how they play. So that, that social aspect of roughhousing, it's more than just a physical activity. It really is about um, self-regulation, which seems counterintuitive because it seems like when children are roughhousing, it's no holds barred. But it really is about self-regulation and reading those social cues from others. We have another question. Oh, my name is Maritza. I actually um, have a preschool in uh, Silver Lake. Um, one of the things that I try, one of the outside rules I have for my children are there no guns, because it's just a, such a fine line and. I don't. I always remind them that when police officers use guns or anybody else use guns, then it's more to protect. But the first thing to do is use your words and try to resolve that first. What is there any other way to kind of handle that issue? Because I know it's a part of what they see and an everyday thing. Well, we have certainly in our. 35-year history of being a, a, a preschool program, seeing every iteration of play and rules revolving around that. We had a no guns rule for a while. What we found with that is that children were still playing guns, but they were hiding it from us, or they were not being honest when we asked them what they were doing. So suddenly the guns were hoses, or they were something else. So we were really teaching children to be deceitful. Um, so we relaxed that a little bit and then just want teachers involved in that activity. Uh, we have three rules. One is that you don't hurt yourself. One, the second is that you don't hurt others, or, and that's physically or emotionally. And the third is that you don't hurt the environment. So if children are playing guns or some other sword play, some, you know, which children need to do, they're processing, they're working through all kinds of problems. Um, Everybody needs to be okay. You know, it's sort of like Calvert talking about everybody has to agree on the rules. You can't shoot somebody that doesn't want to be shot. You know, if you're playing that game, everybody has to be in agreement about it because otherwise it's hurtful. It hurts, you know, I'm, my feelings are hurt if you're shooting me and I don't want to be shot. So what we find is that when you give children that allowance, they actually play it far less because they've had an opportunity to work through it. The other thing that we try to do is offer lots of big, powerful things for children to do because often weapon play is really about exploring power. So having big logs to roll around the yard or sandbags to move or wheelbarrows full of dirt to move really gives children the opportunity to, to be powerful in more appropriate ways. I do a lot of, on my playground, I do a lot of r trying to redirect that. So if I notice that two kids are playing guns, I try to talk to them about what they're playing. And then if they tell me that they're playing Star Wars, then I try to think of a way that they can still play Star Wars and still be rescuing somebody, but it doesn't have to mean them shooting each other. And the same thing, if they're playing cops, I can teach them a way that, well, police also do this kind of thing, and it doesn't involve them pulling out their gun. But I think we also get really concerned about the good and the bad, but that's something that children have to work through, mm -hmm. those kinds of what we feel are, we feel there's gray areas, but learning about kind of justice and fairness is something that they just have to explore on their own. So I think we have to be careful of not, of still allowing them to kind of work through things that we feel are very clear, right? Do we have another question? I think one of the things that oh, can I? Can yeah. I, I think one of the things that we haven't kind of addressed here, and I'd love to hear from maybe some of the early childhood um, specialists too. But, but one of the things that we see in the museum often are varying expectations of play, 
And children play in very different ways at different ages. And it's one of the things that we kind of watch, kind of when you have very small children, maybe two parents who really want to see two, two very young children playing together. But at that age, they play independently. Um, and then there's an, a, a time where they might be playing the same activity, but they're close to each other. So they're playing, they're parallel playing. Um, and that's, I think, something that's just interesting for parents to know because we often put expectations of play on our children. So that's, that's normal? There's nothing wrong with that? No, there's nothing wrong with that, right? That And, and actually trying to encourage two, two very young children to play together is not going to end well. That's not <laughs> how they <laughs> operate, it's right? Not so happen. it's not, yeah. You will, so... So I also think just understanding what is kind of developmentally, what play mm -hmm. is and appropriate what, for that age and point, relaxing our expectations. At what point is it is it appropriate and should you worry if your child is not playing with other children? I'll leave that to one of the early childhood. Do, do you want me to address that? Um, actually, pretend play and social dramatic play where they play with other emerges between 18 months and two years. And... You know, there's a window where you become concerned because now that they're finding that children who do not play cooperatively by the four-ish range um, may have some developmental delays and may warrant screening, so that's when you'd become concerned. But it's always best to err on the side of caution and watch your child and know your child. Um, some children are shyer than others, <laughs> and they may not be inclined to walk into a room and play with children they don't know but if they've been in the same preschool classroom for a year and they're still playing in parallel play and only in parallel play the teacher may be concerned about that and look into some delays and at, and at what point as a parent or as a teacher or do you intervene when children are playing together and it seems like they're not it's not constructive or they're in conflict or you know and, and we've heard from Calvert the the simplicity but maybe like a two or a three-year-old can't do rock paper scissors at what point do you just let it run its course we try to let it run its course we don't want children to get hurt or to get so frustrated that they've lost their ability to negotiate so teachers are nearby we give them every opportunity to, to solve the problem themselves, and that's actually our goal. And you can see it in our four and five year olds who actually can solve problems pretty eloquently on their own. But the younger the child, the more intervention there might be. But even still, with toddlers who are tugging on you know, a bucket that they both want, we're gonna watch and, and see what happens. They're not gonna take the bucket and say, you had it first, you have to wait. They're going to let them tug a little bit and, and see, do they both really want it? Are they going to be okay with the outcome? Um, and just really um, let children lead that. And that, again, that's the beauty of having really good teachers is that they know when that moment is to step in that's not too soon and not too late. Okay. Well, it seems like the kids are having a really <laughs> great time. <laughs> I hope um, you've all been able to hear a lot of the really um, – this is such a great example of boxes and fabric. You don't need anything else. And how all of these stations have blended together, right? Yep. And so it's chair, really chairs have been moved. It's constructive play and they're problem solving and they're innovating. And that's something that today's business leaders are complaining about. College graduates don't know how to innovate. And it's maybe because they didn't have the opportunity to do constructive play like that. Actually, I think we have one last quick question. Cynthia, I have a... Uh, my name's is Cynthia. The I have a microphone doesn't work. You just have to project loudly. Okay. Um, just a quick question. Can you uh, introduce some um, play-based program, a weekday or weekends, where some places we can go? There is the Zimmer Children's Museum, <laughs> uh, where you can go any any day. We're open Tuesday through Friday, um, and we and, and and yeah, membership is very reasonable. Um, and we have all kinds of um, play-based kind of both both teacher-led um, experiences, if that's something. Because we do know that there are varying levels of comfort for parents um, in playing, um, and that's just as adults we. 
we have varying levels of intimidation about about this subject. Um, and so, so we uh, we offer play-based learning that you can come in and play in those environments all the time. Um, we also have play guides that can help you extend that learning at home, so you can do that. And then we have classes as well if that's something that you're interested in. But there are and there are lots. Of, it's not just the Zimmer Children's Museum. There are lots of great organizations, but that's specifically for very young children. We are zero to eight, so probably pre preschool kind of. Um, experiences and kids space is similar of in course. the Pasadena area yeah um, it's another it's a great children's, children's museum, museum in Pasadena um, kids space mm -hmm. if you go to www.playworks.org you can actually get a copy of our playbook um, and that's a list of all of the games with very detailed instructions on how to play them um, and the playbook is actually broken down into um, um, age range, so you can find um, a variety of different games um, for different age ranges, games that need materials, games that don't need materials, games that you can do outside, games that you can do inside, so I would definitely recommend checking that out. www.playworks.org, in case we missed it. And, and I would also just say, I don't know if you, um, there's a lot of like mommy blogs and websites and you know, one like Groupon comes to mind, but they often have really great deals on indoor play spaces like kids space. And so you can get like a four entries for $10, you know, and, and then you just have it. So, you know, there's, and also things like Pinterest. People are, communities are vibrant with activities and ideas and things that you can do at home. Uh, mom, mom blogs are great, but I mean, just search Pinterest or, search or Google um, because there's lots of people and lots of people willing to share resources and ideas. Well, thank you all so much for coming out. Um, the kids, it looks like, are having a ball. Good luck to you all getting them out of here. Yes, they'll be here um, for the rest of the day. Thank you to Julie and the Zimmer Museum for, for hosting us. Thank you to our great panelists. Um, this will be archived online. Um, KPCC's Crawford Family Forum does many events like this, so you can visit kpcc.org, navigate to the Crawford Family Forum, and, and some point after this event, this one will be up, but you'll find the archive of all previous events. Thank you for supporting KPCC. We are a um, public radio station here in Southern California. I'm a reporter there, um, and we hope you keep listening. We're at 89.3 FM, and it is, it is thanks to them that we're able to, to put on events like this. So thank